Well, good morning again, and welcome to our third keynote presentation, Association in the LaSallian Family. Brother Charles Kitson is a graduate of Christian Brothers Academy in Lincroft. Brother Charlie has used his collegiate degrees in Spanish literature, communications, and counseling in the service of the mi mission for over 45 years as a Christian brother. As a teacher, campus minister, director of vocations, and counselor, Brother Charlie has served with distinction in Rhode Island, Guatemala, and beyond. Currently, he is the secretary for the LaSallian Family and Association, bringing energy and vision to the international LaSallian community. Recently, he had a very significant role in the writing of Circular 461 associated for the LaSallian mission, An Act of Hope. And we welcome Brother Charlie. <laughs> Thank you and good morning. Good morning. If, uh, if Brother Dennis the other day said he felt like it was difficult having the first period after lunch, I feel like the substitute teacher who was just told to go into the sophomore study hall on the last period of Friday before Christmas vacation. <laughs> so, uh, uh, actually, being here with you is a, is a delight. Um, but being here in Long Branch is also a delight because, uh, quite honestly, uh, I think I have a memory of two or two of a post-prom party that I was at a little bit <laughs> further down on the beach uh, in 1966. Uh, uh, I'm here in my hometown in many ways. I grew up in this area. Um, it's the first time I've had the opportunity really to be in my home district to do something like a presentation like this. And the other thing is that I'm having the opportunity to do this in front of my family who are here today. Um, and I wanted to introduce uh, my sister, Millie, and my brother-in-law, Bill, and my dad, Charlie, who is going to be 91 next, uh, next month. Uh, uh. They said, we want to know what you do. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sort of afraid of. Uh, uh, so uh, the first thing that came to my mind is I know what happened to Jesus when he tried to say a few things in his hometown. <laughs> But I'll give you my best shot, as long as everything works. <laughs> OK. I can't rely on that, though. I'll, this show will be nothing if I have to keep going like this the whole time. Um, the topic, obviously, of the, of the uh, last, three day, last three days has been the Association for LaSallian Mission, A Journey of Hope, which is a word I'm going to be using all, all this presentation. And the other thing that will be underlying everything I say today is unity and diversity. And everything, pretty much, that I say today will be dealing with the circular, although you may think it's disguised, all right? But it really is part of the circular. You know what I think we need to do is... Turn this on. That, that's good. <laughs> okay. All right. That solves that problem. Now, you may be saying, oh my God, another PowerPoint. Uh, regarding, regarding PowerPoints, I have to tell you this, that I, uh, there's only so much you can say on Circular 461, and I've been saying things for a year now on it. Um, people have heard a presentation I gave in Buttermer uh, two years ago. Some of you were on SIL last year and you heard some of the things I had to say. I spoke about it to the intercapitular meeting so that uh, the district administration was there. Uh, I was asked to give next summer to the, the, nation, the National Assembly, the Regional Assembly of the Brothers, uh, called to be brothers, to do this presentation. So those of you who have seen it before, I'm going to rely on you to start laughing at the proper places, <laughs> and maybe others will follow you. Uh, and I, I apologize if you've seen parts of this before. Parts of this are brand new today. And I don't know what I'm going to do next summer to talk on the circular to the brothers across the country. You'll be, <laughs> there'll probably be some repetition. Let's begin by recalling that we are in God's presence. As we heard at Mass last night, 
This reading from John's Gospel is the introduction to the circular. Cast your nets to the other side of the boat, and they will be filled. There's many ways of interpreting that scripture. Does it really matter which side of the boat the nets get cast to? Is there a correct side to toss the nets? Or is there a deeper meaning there? If we stick with the idea that maybe we're throwing it over the wrong side, we're missing the point. Because perhaps the real point is the reason they threw it over the other side is because they listened to Jesus. Now, Bill Mann, if you are watching this, <laughs> uh, I hope you believe that imitation is the greatest form of flattery because Buttermer 3 was a tremendously refoundational experience for me this summer. This is a Bill Mann idea. I can't take credit for it, but that's the only credit I'm giving you, Bill, throughout the rest of the presentation <laughs> because there are many things this summer that percolated in me as I sat in the classroom with Bill and I listened to the meditations for the founder come alive like they never have before in my life. So that's the last sighting you're going to get, Bill. All right, what do I hope not to do today? Let me just tell you that. First of all, I didn't come here with all the answers, and I don't pretend to have all of the answers. I'm not here to defend theories. Um, I will have strong opinions, and I do have strong opinions on things, but it's not a debate. It's listening to one another. I certainly hope I don't bore anybody this morning. I purposely asked for an hour because I have a lot to say to you, but it'll be rapid fire, as you're going to see. And I'm not trying to get everybody to think alike and to agree on everything. That's not the goal. The goal is to promote discussion because, as Brother Alvaro said the other, uh, the other day, is that the theme of association is not a closed door. It's not a final word. It's growing. So let's take a look at a modern way of seeing how to pass on the charism. And dance, for me, is the way I do things. Hit it. The Los Angeles Towers and two generations. Never stop improving. The thing that Lowe's doesn't say, and I think it's also Gus Lowe's would love this, uh, <laughs> that, that in each of those generations, one of their sons became a brother. So really, the, the, way, the way the whole family came together is, uh, was through dance. And that's really how I've lived my 45 years as a brother. Together in association, the journey and act of hope. I should give uh, Heather Ruppel credit. She sent me that, that YouTube once as a joke, and I said, hmm, I think I can use that. Here's the plan. The first part of this presentation will be on the Circular 461 as of November 2011 from a historical perspective. I call that from Abraham to Alvaro. <laughs> the second part are the critical issues that I think emerge in Circular 461, and I use that Sufi mystic quote that's used in the introduction where it says, out beyond the ideas of right and wrong, there's a field. I'll meet you there. You notice how it takes down the, the fences <laughs> when you say, if they're ideas, and let's talk about them, rather than let's defend them. And the last part is a personal reflection that I'm going to call, pull up a chair. That'll keep you guessing. All right, the circular. More than 12,000 copies of the circular have been sold. 
and it's appearing in the weirdest places around the world. <laughs> the, this document has gotten more press than almost other, I don't want to say any other, but most documents in the Institute. Who's reading it? Take a look at this. That's how many, uh, I was going to say it in Spanish, <laughs> that's how many copies are written in all of the different languages. And as I've been going in around the world, I'm, I'm encouraging the Lasallians everywhere to get it translated into their own languages. I hate to say it, but there are some districts where the brothers are sort of keeping the circular here, and I don't want to question their motives. But uh, I think this, it needs to be in the hands of everyone because it was written not only to the brothers, it was written to the entire Lasallian family. And it's important that the Lasallian family has it in its hands. But notice it's being written in Thai, Pigeon. I was in Papua New Guinea. They're translating it into Pigeon there. Polish. Um, it was just put into Vietnam, Vietnamese. I have an Arabic copy in my office, um, which you have to read <laughs> this way. Um, it's being read everywhere. And it needs to be read in more places. The group that was in SIL last year, I listened carefully to them when they said, why did they read the circular and what did it mean to them? I got things like this. It gave me a sense of hope. And contrary to this, it didn't say that there was one way of being Lasallian. It gave me an appreciation that I belong to a larger international family. It was a celebration of who I am as a Lasallian. It was respectful of the multicultural and the multi-religious dimension of our great family. It was uplifting. Finally, was something was inspirational. It was refreshing. It was reflective and meditative. And I can't tell you around the world how many districts have used it as the basis of retreats. It never talked about a product. It talked about a process. The underlying theme was unity, in diversity. It talks about complementarity. It gave wings to my Lasallian vision. And above all, and throughout the entire document, it talks about my vocation as a Lasallian woman or a Lasallian man. You think it's easy finding a picture of Abraham? <laughs> If God said to you, sacrifice your firstborn, you might look like that too, all right? From Abraham to Alvarosa, hang on, because this is going to be really fast, obviously. Here I am, Lord. When God first meets Abraham, or I should say vice versa, Abraham says, here I am, Lord. Now notice, Abraham does not say, what do you want me to do? He says, here I am. Here I am, Lord, in your presence. Here I am in the holy presence of God. It's about presence. It wasn't about doing. The first response was, I'm here. Here I am, Lord. And you know, that's pretty fundamental to all of the world's major religions. Once we're in God's presence, we're not meant to just stay there. As Litzau would say, there needs to be a double contemplation. It's the, it's the contemplation, but it's the activity that follows from that. So then we are people who are called and we are sent. So that's the Lasallian dance. It's the presence, it's the realization of the call, and it's being sent, which is the commitment part. Let's take a look at this issue. How do you recognize a Lasallian? Well, I think it's undeniable that we are, yeah, first of all, it's undeniable that John Baptist de La Salle was a priest of the Roman Catholic Church and founded a community, an institute of brothers in the Roman Catholic Church. There's no denying that. There's no embarrassment about it. There's no reason for us to say that's, well, oh, maybe that's true. No, that's not that. It's, that's who we are. We're, we're not embarrassed about that. In fact, we're very proud of that. However, Jesus is so central to what is Lasallian. You read the meditations for the time of retreat. 
it's, it's, it's all focused on St. Paul's, mostly St. Paul's vision of, of Jesus in the lives of the, of the apostles in the early church. Jesus is central, period. I just came from Asia. 160 years ago, the brothers left Europe and they arrived in Asia, and they found a reality that was very different, very different. They were opening up schools for Muslims, for Buddhists, for Hindus, the brothers of the Christian schools. These men were over there saying, we are not here to proselytize. We are here to evangelize. And evangelize means I have to be the gospel that these people will see. I'm not trying to convert you. I'm trying to be the gospel in your presence. I repeat, there's no denying that Jesus is the center of LaSallean spirituality. Out of that comes our commitment to journey as daughters and sons of De La Salle to take his life and to try to make it an overlay onto ours and to see how we can live a LaSallean life for us, I presume most people in the room are Christian, for us as Christians to live closer to Jesus closer to De La Salle's story, which is God's presence. Now, unity in diversity is the underlying theme of the entire circular. These were the posters that were used in the Philippines, and I, I was there for a, a, a Congress, an international Congress of alumni from all around the world, but mostly Asia. So I was talking last week to an audience that was mostly Muslim and Buddhist and Hindu or uh, atheists. One of the things I said to them, I said, in all of our agencies and in all of our schools, we do not welcome kids into them because those kids are Catholic or because they're not Catholic. We welcome them because we're Catholic. The same thing is true of the LaSallean family. We don't welcome people around the world into the LaSallean family because they're Catholic. We welcome them because we're Catholic. Out of that Congress, there's, a, there's going to be a global push on the part of the Filipino province, the district, that we, are, we see ourselves as one LaSalle. Around the world as one LaSalle. We're not talking necessarily about logos here. We're talking about the concept of that we are one LaSalle. All right, let's take a look at this. And now, admittedly, this is in a Christian perspective. I'm using a baptismal commitment here to try to visualize the vocation issue. If we take a look at the brothers and the sisters, I put the sisters in here because we have two groups, uh, two congregations of LaSallean sisters. But it could apply to, to sisters, Jean is in the back there, uh, uh, priests who are, who are with us. But these are mostly the, the orders that are LaSallean uh, by essence. Um, and lay LaSalleans. And I know that's a vocabulary issue, and I wish I didn't have to make distinctions like this, but see if, this, see if it works for you. We have the same baptismal consecration. It's a given. That makes us unique and distinct. You notice it doesn't make us better that we're Catholics, that we're Christians. It just makes us unique and distinct as we walk through the world as Catholic Christians, if that's who we are. The same charism the same charism. As an adult lay LaSallean, I'll use that expression, I don't like it, but I'm using it for just comparisons here. I make, I, an, I make a unique adult response to my original call in baptism. 
The same thing is true of the brothers and the sisters. It's a unique adult response to the original call, the original call we all share. But I have, a dis as a brother, I have a distinct way of living out my original call. Distinct, not better, not worse. It's just a distinct way of living out that call. And so does everybody else who's uh, part of the Losanian family who doesn't have FSC after their name. It's a, your distinct way of living out your original call. And we call that vocation, all right? It doesn't diminish, it's complementary. I don't become less of a brother because I acknowledge your vocation as a Lasallian. This is where we get into complementarity. When we take a look at mission, it's the same thing. Same mission. That's what unites us. Vocation is lived out through the mission. All right, fasten your seatbelts because we're going to go from 1651 to 2008 in about three minutes. Remember this story? What happened in 1651 when he was born, and then in 1680 when the Institute was founded, changed. In the 50s, I joined in 66, and it was even similar in 66. Some of our communities look like this. Anybody remember those days? Raise your hand, come on. Does anybody remember communities like that? Okay, yes. Anybody, anybody went to a school where you had a community of brothers that it was like that size? You know, 30 brothers in a house, right. Um, it's over. It doesn't exist anymore. Does that mean the whole thing is over? No. It just looks different now. The same passion that those men had in those days is still alive in the same men who have followed De La Salle's brothers, but in the women and men who have followed the Lasallian tradition and are ministering in our, in our agencies and in our schools. And it does look very different today. Even De La Salle looks different today, <laughs> <laughs> thanks to Ed Phelan. You know? um, but it's the, same, it's the same passion that it's the fire in the belly that gets us to do what we do every day. All right, the circular four, five, six. You notice how in Rome, we use, first of all, all we do is write circulars. It's, everything's going around and around and around and around. Um, I don't know where that word came from. Um, and everything is numbered precisely. So this is circular four, five, six. It was written at the result, at the end of the last general chapter, the 44th general chapter. And it was, it, the circular was called towards the year 2014. February of 2008 was when I got a phone call from Brother Alvaro. I was very happy in Rhode Island, um, saying, Charlie, pack your bags, you're coming to Rome. I was like, oh my God. Um, and then he handed me the circular when I got there. And he said, here's your job description. And then I really said, oh my God. New structures were mandated from the last general chapter. Brother Antonio Botana, who was quoted a couple of times already in this assembly, he was the predecessor, my predecessor in the job. I, I, I always tell Antonio, I said, you, were the guru, you are the guru of, of association. He's the theologian, he's the formation person, he's written books on the art. That's, that's, that's Antonio, and he did an extraordinary job. Uh, it's not me, though. <laughs> I, I'm taking this, not in another direction, but I see it through way different lenses that I, I'm sorry to say, maybe I'm not sorry to say, our social work lenses. <laughs> I see the Lasallian family through a very different lens. Uh, it looks different. I am the coordinating secretary of the Lasallian family and association. Coordinating. I'm not in charge. This is Monse Nieto. She's a woman from Spain who is the co-secretary with me of the Lasallian family. At least we look like the family. All right? Um, she's a sweetheart. Uh, then in 2010, the family got younger. 
We got Joseph Gilson, who is now a full-time uh, employee at, of Rome. Uh, he's the international coordinator for young Lasallians around the world. It made me the grandfather of the family. <laughs> I hate it, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's true. I am. But it looks different. I was told that in two years, I should develop a, a model for the Lasallian family. I remember going into the, I went into the council meeting and I said to the council, shaking, it was my first time, it's like going to Oz. You sit in that room and they're all there and I go, whoa. And uh, I said, you know, I don't think there is a model. And they were like, oh. and, and they said, but the chapter is mandating that. And I said, well, I'm not sure if there is one. I'll try to find one, all right? So what did I find out? I found out some Lasallians prefer to be anonymous Lasallians. I found other Lasallians are saying, whoa, wait a minute, the toothpaste is out of the tube. Uh, we need to go backwards. We don't need to go forwards. And then other Lasallians were saying to me, let's just tell people what to do. <laughs> That's going to work. It always worked. Others are saying, well, no, if we look at it as like a warm, fuzzy, cozy family, that'll be the way we'll get people together. Others are saying, well, if we had a few superheroes, that's what we need. Others are saying, well, if we all looked alike and dressed alike, and th that would do it. Others are saying, well, if we all thought alike, that would do it. And I started to scratch my head and say, uh, I'm supposed to come up with a model in two years uh, for the LaSallian family. So what did we do? Monse and I got together and said, we need to survey the entire world <laughs> to find out what's going on. We sent out a questionnaire to the, every district and delega delegation in the institute. And we got an enormously good response. We got 40 out of 53 responses. So we felt we had a very good snapshot of the Institute. What did we ask them about? We asked them about how is association understood in your district? How are associates considered? Are they de facto associates or are they publicly recognized associates? The, un the Lasallian family, is it really an umbrella term where everybody fits in? Or is there a model that we should be going towards? Accompaniment, what are our formation programs like in all of our districts around the world? And is there diversity in community life as we live it in a Lasallian way throughout the world? So that we, we got wonderful information that had to be analyzed and it was, and that took up the first year and a half of, of, the, of the work that we were doing. And then this, this circular was born through the, uh, the Superior General and the General Council on September 1st, 2010. Now, you know, you can please some of the people some of the time, but you can't please all of the people all the time. <laughs> so there's things in the circular as I go around that people say, I don't agree with that. And I go, well, you don't have to agree with it, but it's a snapshot of the Institute where we are right now. So if you don't agree with it, uh, it means you're denying what's happening. Uh, so please just uh, accept it as what's real. It doesn't mean it's the final word, but it is what's going on right now. So as one visitor once said to the brothers in my district, the train is pulling out of the station, so would you please hop on? Because if you don't, I'm sorry. <laughs> Greg Copra from the San Francisco district, who's flying into Rome the same time Steve and I are. Um, uh, he said, all Lasallians can find themselves in the circular. And I believe that that's true. <laughs> all Lasallians can find themselves in, in, in the circular. Uh, there's a place for everyone in the circular. So what are some of the critical issues? Let's take a look at these. And remember what I said about the Sufi mystic is that out beyond the ideas of right and wrong, there's a field. Let's go to the field right now. I have to be honest with you. I don't think, I think he's already back in Pittsburgh. We're, we're this is seen through my eyes, okay? <laughs> that, uh, that's Bobby Schaefer behind me. I think he's already in Pittsburgh. Uh, and Bob Sheila wouldn't put a mask on. Uh, 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 mess up his hair. Yeah, that's right, would mess his hair. Uh, so, uh, but I have to admit that this is seen through my eyes. Uh, this is not ex cathedra, all right? Th th this, is, this is the way I see things. And it's fasten your seatbelt. It's a 67-page document, and I'm going to go through this in about 15 minutes. Edu association for mission.
this, this is not Lasallian Association from the show. <laughs> this is a better representation of it, okay? It's dynamic. It's circular. It's inclusive. It's complementary. There's no beginning and end because it's living. That's what association is right now. Antonio talks about association in two distinct ways. The first one is the experience of the early brothers. As he says, the term that the founder and the first brothers used to describe their experience of communion for the mission. I am not going to be talking about that today. I am not a Lasallian scholar. Uh, I also, th that's not, the, the, this, the uh, circular did deal with that in the beginning, but most of the circular deals with us as a family, which is the second point. It's the ecclesiastical practice of describing the, co the collaboration between religious and lay persons who share the same charism. That's us people. So what are some of the critical issues? In our district of Dina, is association a vocational response or an acquired status? Now, you think of all the places where you work and see faces, okay? Are there people who want to go to programs so that they can go up the ladder? Are there people who feel like it's my vocation and I'm just following where God's calling me? It's so clear in the circular that association can never, ever be an acquired status. It's not a trophy you give to somebody. It's something that's evoked from the person, and it's their life response to a mission. What process does LaSallian discernment follow in our district? How do we encourage people along the journey? Are there levels of a LaSallian association? I have to be honest with you. I avoid the word levels all the time because it implies people are up or down. I think there's different ways of being in LaSallian association. Is association for now or forever? Uh, I think it was Lois the other day who said in her response, um, well, what happens when I retire? Am I still LaSallian? For the brothers, uh, you're always LaSallian. But what about me? What, what, what happens? If I'm not working in a LaSallian ministry right now, am I still LaSallian? And how do we promote LaSallian vocations? Very important issue. My first year in the job, I was, oh, I'll say it, I was criticized for talking too much about lay people. My second year in the job, I got criticized for talking too much about brothers. My third year in the job, I said, ah. <laughs> I said, I'm just going to talk. And uh, I still am. The one thing I want to say about the vocation issue is this, the vocation, the Lasallian vocation to be a De La Salle Christian brother. Watch our vocabulary, please. When we use expressions like, well, we know the brothers are dying, I go, whoa, no, don't say that. because. Our vocabulary will betray, will be self-fulfilling prophecy. If we keep saying, well, the brothers are dying, the brothers, then you might as well bury us. We can't talk like that. And I'm not trying to put my head in the sand and say it's not happening. But we have to be positive, and we have to be encouraging. So please watch what we say when we talk about the brothers. Um, and that comes from brothers as well as, as, as everyone else in the family. Okay, this is in the circular. It's the constitutive elements of being an associate. I think everybody in this room is going to be able to say, yep, that's me. At least I hope you can. First of all, I see it as a vocation, as a call. Secondly, that it belongs to the De La Salle story. I share in the charism and the journey. Third thing is that it's got to be lived out in community somehow. Doesn't mean we're all under the same roof, but there has to be a community element. It has to be connected with the LaSallian educational mission somehow. And there has to be some duration of time. Nothing specific, but I can't just show up the first day and go to the school and say, I'm a LaSallian associate. It needs time to mellow. It, it needs progress. It needs process. It needs information. And it has to be together and by association. And this I'm going to be repeating all the time because I think it's a concept that first of all, Michelle Savage, who was a great LaSallian scholar, was the one who explained as together is local. So if I'm at uh, CBA Lincroft, that's together. Association is here, all right? We are getting better at association uh, because association not only means here and Dina, 
as, as uh, Dominic and Steve told us the other day, it means that there's a whole Italian world out there that needs us too. We belong to them. Those kids in Rwanda are ours. So together means I'm just at my place. And if I am, I'm going to say it, I'm not really Lasallian. If I'm only for my place. Because right from the get-go, De La Salle helped his brothers understand that you are together, but you are in association. OK, so I tried to put it in a sentence, and it came out like this, if it helps. A Lasallian associate is one who lives a Lasallian vocation in God's presence through community for the sake of the mission, together and by association. It's one way of taking those five elements and putting them into a sentence. Now, this is all nice theory, but how is it lived out in real life? Now, becoming a Lasallian associate, is it something like this? Is it all the warm furries, or is it the process that looks a little bit more like this? For the human and Christian education of the young, especially the poor. That's how much we got to want it. And that's also all of the, the, I mean, everybody can say, oh yeah, remember I was at that point once, I remember, <laughs> I remember jumping from here to there. And it's a process, it doesn't happen overnight. And the other thing is that real people are doing it. Uh, I get into a few discussions here over the last few days, is that we focus so much on the mission, sometimes we forget, and the kids, that we forget about us. We are the people doing the mission, flesh and blood people who have ups and downs. And it's not easy sometimes. And that's where the community dimension has to come in. In our district, is there competition? Now, I'm sorry, but if I get into elephants in the living room here, I'm, go I'm going there, all right? Um, is there competition in the district between groups? Lasallian competition, <laughs> you know, is it is lilac better than llamas? Is llamas better than palms? You know, um, do we have uh, the d we have de facto associates? Um, is anyone considering being an officially recognized associate? Oh my God, you know, if they, uh, what, who do they think they are? You know, it's like uh, around the world, pictures are different. Um, uh, Lasallian family is everybody part of it? You know, how about these young Lasallians? Do they really should they have a voice? They're only young. You know, where do the brothers fit in? Where's the competition in Dina? The other thing is that I was saying about together and by association, sometimes we're very good at together, but we're not good by uh, association. We all live in our own little globes here, and we're not really associated, although we say we are. And then if you talk about finances, you'll find out how together we are and maybe not how associated we really are. Um, and the other sad thing is that we rely sometimes on charismatic people, and once they're gone, there's nothing. So we have to work a ways of institutionalizing many of the things we do and not rely on one or two people who have a certain charism. So the decision is, do we want everybody the same, or are we open to unity in diversity? These two guys, the important thing is not what they're wearing, it's that they're on the same beach. Because there is going to be that kind of a difference, and there is, believe me, I get a chance to go around the world and see this, and there's a tremendous diversity. But in that diversity, there is unity. And as Brother Alvaro said the other day, association is being constructed each day, and it can never, ever be an imposition. It's always an invitation. You invite, you invite, you invite, you form, you form, you form, you affirm, you affirm, you keep inviting. All right, the LaSallian family. Critical issue number two. In our district, is everybody invited to be a part of the family? 
Or do we have those people we say, oh, no, they're, they're not. <coughs> <laughs> what if one is in Catholic or Christian? Can they be part of the family? Are Lasallian women equal partners? <laughs> I was very happy to hear there was a group of Lasallian women meeting prior to this assembly to talk about their role as Lasallian. Brother Alvaro was extremely clear. The general counsel was very clear. There's a whole section in the circular on the role of a Lasallian woman and the gift you are to our family. And guys, they outnumber us. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's, but it's not a competition, Lois is right. Uh, uh, it's not a competition, really. Uh, in May, I'm going to be flying to Bangkok to assist in the first international Lasallian Women's Symposium in Asia. Um, four guys were invited. Alvaro and I are going. Um, so uh, I'll report back. Uh, it's not an either or, it's the complementarity and it's the gift that women bring to our family that we want to celebrate. But the other question too is what about the brothers? I think there's a little bit of this going on sometimes. In 1949, all of you lay people were considered a necessary evil to us. We allowed some of you to work in our schools, but that was only because we needed you, all right? Then we got rid of you when we could. Now the tables have turned. We feel like the cat. And then like you're up there going, hmm, how do you like it? <laughs> All right, get a little, little bit of your own medicine, huh? Um, uh, what about the equality? And then what about among the brothers? You know, <laughs> is, it, uh, is it the tyranny of the old brothers? And the young brothers don't have a chance to say much because there's too many of us. Oh, I just called myself an old brother. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, we have to take a look at that question. <coughs> and then does everyone have to be on the same place in terms of faith and zeal? I hope the answer is no. Chapter 3 of the document says, let it be stated clearly and unambiguously that calling oneself Lasallian is not relegated only to those of the Christian faith. Many faith-filled people professing other creeds participate daily in the Lasallian educational mission. They are a valued part of this community. It could not be clearer. It goes on to say, in quoting the general chapter, the 43rd general chapter, we should note that in the composition of these association groups, one can meet brothers, other Christians, members of other religions, and persons of goodwill whose point of reference, blah, blah, blah. The audience I spoke to last week in Manila, there were a lot of people from Japan uh, who are non-Christian, non-Catholic, uh, non-believers. So I pulled this quote out because I said, uh, notice it says here, and you're going to find persons of good will. I said, if there's anybody in here of ill will, I'd like to meet you at the break um, because I presume that this throws out the net to every single person in the Lasallian family whether you are a Roman Catholic or a person of goodwill, that you belong, you fit, as long as you start the journey and, and walk along and deepen in whatever way is appropriate for you. The chapter says that the Lasallian family, and that's just what I'm saying, is that it's all those who participate in the educational enterprise, but especially those who are moving. Moving is the operative word here. That people who are in being invited to go deeper and deeper into this religious journey, if you are a believer, it's, it's that God is calling me towards this. It's my vocation. So if it's really my vocation, it doesn't end when I stop working. You got to respect people's pace, though. As Brother Alvaro said, association is never an imposition. People will come to it if they are at their own time, but we have to keep inviting, 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 all right? There's a basic flaw in this next thing I'm going to do because it looks like the brothers and sisters are directly involved with the mission and the lay people are just tangentially. I couldn't get all the, the things together, so I, I apologize. Uh, the top wheel should be down lower. All right, who belongs to this mission? First of all, it's all inclusive. When we talk about LaSallian family, it is all inclusive. Usually people come through our schools or our agencies it's a process, as I said. 
All LaSallean associates are automatically members of the LaSallean family. And friends, benefactors, affiliates um, are part of the family. Now, you have the real, uh, the ideal, and you have the real. Everybody has their pace. Do you ever get a feeling that there are people on your faculty, as I'm sure, who, get, who feel like this guy right here? That dog is going to, it does not want to see the vet, all right? Um, he's going to have to be pulled through the door, um, which would do violence to him. But sometimes in our lives, haven't we felt like that, that we just want to put the brakes on and say, whoa, because we don't know what's on the other side of the door. And we need to be invited to put our paws down <laughs> and to say, it's going to be okay. I'll walk you in. This is the social worker coming out of me. Brother Alvaro kept repeating the other day, belonging is so important. Well, the question is then, how do I belong? Think of your ministries right now. How do people belong? I think all you have to do is say, first of all, this is, I, my family is here, so this is a little bit embarrassing, but um, how did you belong to your families? What number are you in the, uh, the food chain? The way you belonged in your family is the way you belong everywhere. So all of us, when we arrived on Thursday night, went into the social, how did you act? That's the way people are reacting to the LaSallean family in your agency and in your institution. Some of us are like this. We just dive right in. We walk right into a room, boom, it's like, hi, I'm Charlie, but you know, it's like, others are, ho, ho, I like to, I want to observe, you know, we, we had a whole table of observers, but it was the misnomer of the century. Uh, 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 nobody was observing, they're all talkers. Uh, others are like, you force your way in. There could be some reasons why people would do that, but um, you, just, you, you, you just barrel your way in. Others are like, uh, well, if you chase me enough, maybe I'll belong. You know, like, they like to be, like to be courted. Others are like a deer in headlights. Ho! Oh! No, it's, this is too much. And others are just, their reaction is just, the whole thing is very boring, <laughs> all right? So it's how do you belong to the LaSallean family? How did you belong to your family? What do you see in your institutions? And how do you get those people who feel like this, how do you find their entry point into the LaSallean family? Also, our family is dysfunctional. I think that's why Brother Alvaro called me, because I worked for 15 years with dysfunctional families. That to, to say that there are no elephants, <laughs> to, <laughs> to say that there are no elephants in our living rooms is a lie. We are a dysfunctional family. But you show me one that isn't. Why should the Lasallian family be any different from any other family? But we need to deal with those elephants in the living room. We need to deal with the elephants in Dina. We need to, lead, need to deal with the elephants in my living room at home. All right. And one question I don't think anybody ever asks us is, what scares me most about this whole thing? Do we ever sit around and talk about how frightened this whole thing makes me? Like, I don't know whether to take another step because I don't know where that's going to bring me. And to tell you the truth, I'm tired. Do we ever talk to each other about human issues about being LaSallean? Critical issues three in our district. Are all LaSalleans co-responsible for the mission? Can a LaSallean ever say no? That's what I was just saying. Are we so guilt-ridden that you can never say no because then people are going to say, oh, you're a bad LaSallean? Is this another time of crisis or a crossroad, to use the, the vocabulary from the circular? <laughs> Who is the heart, memory, and guarantor of the charism? And I was so happy to see Alan and, and Dennis in the introductory letter talking about that we all are. We all are those three things. And then how can we promote co-responsibility in other regions of the Institute? It's an issue that I think is less tangible to you. Um, I see it all the time because what I'm saying to you, you may be sitting there with questions or you may be thinking I'm crazy, but you just send me to other parts of the world and they're going to start throwing things. Um, so uh, things uh, are not the same all around the world. We're trying to move people along. 
you never know what the motive is if, uh, when you're fishing. So the future of the Osayan mission is in our hands, all right? It is now, as I say, it's urgent more than ever. And there's only one way, I think, to secure the mission. I'm going to move a little fast here because I've got so much I want to do. Uh, is it going to be through general chapters, institute circulars, international councils, formation programs, mission assemblies? Maybe. Personally, I think the only way to secure the future of the mission is individually and then communally. We have to have a personal <coughs> encounter with our God. As Delisal says in his meditations, this one is the meditation for Christmas and the meditation for St. Andrew, that he told the brothers they have to resemble Jesus Christ. When they walk into a room, the kids should see Jesus. That's what we're being called to do as Lasallian women and men today, to resemble Jesus. The only way I can resemble Jesus is if I know Jesus. I heard at a Huther workshop once, someone said, you may be the only book on De La Salle someone will ever read. Your life may be the only book someone will ever read on De La Salle. It's the same with Jesus. They'll know him through us but I have to know him first. The Lasallian family, it says in the circular, uh, accompany one another by constantly inviting each colleague to deepen not only their educational commitment, but their relationship with God. You know, we don't really emphasize this that much. We work on the educational mission, but do we encourage each other in deepening our relationship with God? It's a question. I'm going to, I sh I'm, I'm going to, the, the, the women religious, by the way, they got together in, in June. Uh, sometimes I think the sisters are w way ahead of us sometimes. <laughs> they decided to have a week long of contemplation where they were in silence, in group silence many times to listen before they acted. To get to know the God and listen to what God's saying before we start making decisions. We're ready for the next move, but sometimes we don't know what it is. Let's go with pull up a chair. This is the last section. Well, maybe it's not exactly that kind of chair. <laughs> maybe the chair is more of an invitation to go deeper. Maybe it's, an, uh, it's a meditation on this icon by Rublev on the Holy Trinity, which was so dear and so central to Lasallian spirituality. This is a depiction of father, mother, son, spirit. If you notice, there's one thing very important in this icon, is that as they sit there in their divinity, at a table, there's a place for one more. There's a place waiting for us in the Trinity. Baptism is our invitation to that place, and I'm going to call it a dance. And why do I call it a dance? I'm calling it a dance because De La Salle says that the foundation of the first community of the brothers is the Blessed Trinity because theirs is a relationship, a communal relationship. <laughs> it's not static. When I can remember the brothers and the sisters saying to me, you're holding up the shamrock and saying, you know, the Holy Trinity is this, and I think intellectually I might have had an idea, but quite honestly it never made a lot of sense to me until Bill Mand explained it this summer at Buttermer, that the Holy Trinity is what I'm calling love in motion. That when I pull up a chair, I may be in silence. I may listen or I may talk, but I need to pull up the chair. I need to spend time first and then we'll see what happens once you pull up a chair. The other icon that was so important to De La Salle was what happens when you pull up the chair. It's Pentecost. That once you spend time, then you go out. Then you're told to go out and preach the gospel all over the world. Now, this is going to be a personal note that I'm ending on here. Uh, I'm a dancer, so, uh, and these hips are starting to move again. So. Uh, but you know what I've learned in uh, being a human being? That the things in my life that I always thought were so personal and nobody would ever understand, when I finally told somebody, they said, oh yeah, me too. 
I believe that the things that I think are so personal are really universal. And that's what I want to tell you about. This past year for me, to quote Dickens, was the worst of times, the best of times, it was the worst of times. Actually, it was the worst of times. Right before Christmas of last year, I was diagnosed with growths in my bladder. Uh, I had three different surgeries this year to work on this issue. April 7th, the church feast of the founder, my mom passed away. July 25th, I had both hips replaced. Now you're sitting there going, so, so what? <laughs> you oh, you want to know what my year was like? <laughs> you know? Uh, am I supposed to feel sorry for this guy? <laughs> well, we all have these years where we don't really exactly feel like ourselves. Ever have one of those years where you just don't feel like everything is the way it's supposed to be? <laughs> Everybody can say yes. This year for me, when I look at it, it was more like a Zacchaeus experience because I lost Jesus somewhere along the line. And I climbed a tree to try to find him again. And that's when he said to me, Charlie, come down from the tree because I'm coming to sit at your house for dinner. And when I got to my house, I found an empty chair. And all he said to me was, Charlie, pull up a chair. So I did. What happens when you pull up a chair? I got in touch with a lot of suffering. Uh, living with the pain of knowing that that which was is no longer. My physical condition, what I had before, is like I see life through different lenses now is no longer. My mom passed away. Um, it's tough with my dad here, but is no longer. Uh, I now have metal hips. I don't know where my old ones are. <laughs> <laughs> they, they're on the floor of some operating room. Um, but they're, I'm no longer what I was. It moved from suffering to emptiness. And emptiness was the experience of that. There was no light at the end of the tunnel. And I was constantly being ambushed by grief and by loss. You ever have those moments? It was empty. And then came a very specific time. And I can still remember the evening. I was at my dad's house. I was lying in bed. It was a couple of weeks after the surgery in September, in August. And uh, I gave up. And I gave in. I let go and I let in. I started a free fall of feeling powerless and afraid. Really what I, I did is I lifted up my arms in the bed. I was crying my eyes out. And I said to God, I can be no more. I can do no more. I've had it. I beg you. I am begging you to help me out here. I don't ever remember doing that in my life. I surrendered. I don't know about the women, but, but I know for some guys it's really hard to just give up. And I gave up. But I knew I would fall into the arms of a loving God. I wasn't going to go into a black hole. But I gave up. St. Augustine talks about it in the Confessions. And it's a wonderful thing he says. He's, he's saying to God, he says, you were within, but I was without. You were with me, but I wasn't with you. So you called, you shouted, you broke my deafness, you flared, blazed, and you banished my blindness. You lavished your fragrance, and I gasped. That night, I gasped. And if you've ever been in that situation before, you know what it's like to gasp. It's like the last breath, and you've got to have some knowledge that you're going to make it. And what happened, once I did that, hope started to bubble up in me. That imperceptible urge to knowing that what lies ahead is not only possible, but worth every ounce of strength I had. Not a nice poster. It's worth every ounce of strength that you have. And where does that lead you to? It led me to commitment. A time of choosing where my energies will go, a time of refoundation of my spirit that bubbles up and says, Charlie's back. It happened to me in Rome when I got back there that I was at a meeting, and at the end of it, one of the guys looked at me and he said, 
Charlie's back. And that's not just geographically. He said, for, for this year, you've been somewhere else, but you're back. And in Manila last week when I was giving this talk, Charlie was back. And when I got up to dance that night, Charlie was back. <laughs> it's great to be back, but it's great to remember the journey. And you always go back, by the way. But I'm going to tell you, this process doesn't happen up for once and then it's over. It happens over and over again. St. Camillus had it pretty well when he says, commitment is doing what you said you would do after the feeling you said it would happen, after the feeling you said it in had passed. I'm sure this surfer is thinking that, you know. Uh, he's committed to surfing, but whoa, you know. That's what commitment is. It's not good feelings. It's a decision. Now, by the way, this is not rocket scientist. I am not a theologian, by the way. I'm just talking about what it means to be human. Anybody in this room has ever fallen in love, and I hope everybody has, you know the progression from suffering, emptiness, surrender, hope, and commitment. It's part of our lives. Now, let's, let's put this over on the Lasallian mission, because it's not just for me. I don't believe what I received this year was just for me. It follows the same trajectory. Suffering. What was is no longer. How many of us hear stories about, oh, the brothers were like this, remember, and all the teachers in this school was such a great school, and now it's like a former shell of what it used to be, and yeah, you know. People are suffering. People are feeling empty because once you feel the suffering, then it's like you're confusing. You know, like, what do, what do, what do we do? You, everyone looks around at each other. It's like, you know, it's after the ascension, and everybody's looking at each other. What do we do now? Then it's time to surrender. And that's the process that I believe we're going through as a district and as an institute right now, of taking that leap of faith into the unknown without, the, without a map and not knowing what this next step is. But once we do that, that's when hope bubbles up. And I, I use the expression bubbles up in together and by association and into co-responsibility which leads to commitment, putting my life's energies at the service of the LaSallian mission, which all of you, ladies and gentlemen here, do, and do so well. So what happens when you pull up a chair? Does this look familiar? Does it look similar? De La Salle pulled up a chair. He sat down, and then he made a heroic vow to keep this going, even if he had to live on bread and water. It also could look like this. It could look like this. It could also look like this. This is a young man, not me, okay? This is, <laughs> this is a young man, his name is Bashara. He graduated from Bethlehem University a couple of years ago. When I was over there in the Holy Land, he took me on a tour. This, this guy, he said, brother, because of my LaSallian education, I've got to tell you a story. He said, you see that hill over there? My family has lived on the top of that hill for generations. Ten years ago, Zionist settlers have come in and they've surrounded the bottom of the hill. And it makes it very difficult for us to get to where we have to go at our home. He said, I went home, talked to my parents. We prayed about it. We pulled up a chair. And we decided we were going to start a movement. And the movement is called, We Refuse to Be Enemies. They met with those settlers and they said, I'm sorry, but we will not become your enemies. And we will not allow you to become our enemies. So there'll be no enemies here. He's on tour right now in the States, giving talks on Palestinian-Israeli relations with his whole movement on, We Refuse to Be energy, <coughs> uh, Enemies. Why? Because he and his family pulled up a chair. It's waiting for all of us. And I'm going to end today with the story of the two camels. It's a little science story. There was a, there's two camels, a mother camel and, a, and, a, and her son. And they're standing there. A little guy runs over to mom and he says, Ma, I got some questions for you. So she says, OK, what are they? He said, listen, can you tell me why we've got these really big eyelashes? 
She said, well, that's easy. She said, because, you know, when we're out in the desert and we're running through the desert and the storm takes up the sand, we don't get sand in our eyes, so we can keep seeing. He said, that's pretty good. Next, he goes, well, then, all right, next question is, can you, can you tell me why I got this big hump on my back? She said, well, that's easy, too, because that's where we store water, and we can go for long distances in the desert without having to stop for water. She says, okay, Mom, one more question. I got these webbed feet. Why do we have webbed feet? So, well, the webbed feet are because when we run through the sand, we don't sink in. And we can go long distances fast because we don't sink, get stuck in the sand. So he's thinking about this, and he looks at his mother, and he says, okay, Mom, I understand now why we got the eyelashes, why I got this hump, why I got these webbed feet. But can you tell me why, why are we both standing here in the Bronx Zoo? <laughs> I said it's a Lasallian story because <laughs> we have been equipped with the eyelashes to see. And we've got the hump so we can go the long distances. And we've got the webbed feet so we don't get stuck. But for God's sake, so many of us are in the zoo when we don't belong in the zoo. You know, we're meant to get out there and to do and to be and to meet challenges even when we're exhausted. We're meant to pass on the charism to the young people, and please keep that in mind all the time, because we're getting older, and if we don't do that, then it might be over. It's so, so important. And I am so very happy to have been here with you this morning. I want to end with this quote from Jeremiah, which is my favorite, it ends the circular, where Jer God says to Jeremiah, I know the plans I have in store for you, they are plans for your welfare and not for your woe. When you come to me in prayer, I will listen to you. When you come to me with your whole heart, surrender. I will be with you, and I will gather you up from all the places where you are, and I will bring you home. St. John Baptist de La Salle, and live Jesus in our hearts. Thank you very much, Brother Charlie, for sharing with us and inspiring us with your words this morning. We thank you for being here and being present with us. You're welcome. Uh, as we continue to our table discussion, uh, we'll have table discussion to about 10.30, where we'll begin reporting out, and then at 10.45, right after the reporting, we'll have a brief break. Thank you.